oral questions. Question oral, the Honorable Leader of the Opposition. After 500 billion in inflationary deficits and taxes that have been increased on farmers, the cost of food has grown more than in 40 years. Now we have learned that in one month, 1.5 million visits have been recorded to food banks here in Canada. When the government will it recognize that Canadians can no longer pay more? When will they stop their inflationary policies? The Honourable Minister of Tourism. We know that Canadians are facing difficult times, but this question speaks to two very different visions for our country. One where the Conservatives say to Canadians, they're on their own, the government should not have invested in you, the government should not have an affordability plan. Mr. Speaker, on the other hand, is our government that was there for Canadians when they needed us during the pandemic, that got the economy back on track, and now we have an affordability plan that will double the GST, that will provide dental care to 500 million kids, and that will also give housing supplements to Canadians who need it the most. We will never abandon Canadians like they propose we do. Before we continue, I just want to remind the honourable members that just because their hand is like this over their mouth doesn't mean we can't see who's shouting. So I just wanted to point that out. The honourable leader of the opposition. Well, the member would have Canadians believe that they've never had it so good. Yes. Well, if that were true, then we wouldn't have 1.5 million visits to the food bank in a single month in Canada. That's a 35 percent increase since 2019. This is after half trillion dollars of inflationary spending bid up the cost of goods and new taxes on farmers has made food more expensive. Now their plan is to triple, triple, triple the carbon tax. Will they reverse that plan so that Canadians can afford to eat? The Honourable Minister for Families. Speaker, there is a very clear difference on this side of the House in terms of what we are doing to support Canadians. Since we were elected in 2015, Mr. Speaker, 1.3 million Canadians have been lifted out of poverty, and that includes over 450,000 children, Mr. Speaker. We will not take any lessons from the Conservatives who are looking to cut benefits, who are voting against supporting Canadians, and who today actually have an opportunity to do the right thing if they care about Canadian families and vote to support dental and rental support. Yeah. Honourable Leader of the Opposition. When the Prime Minister spent $6,000 for one hotel room per night in London and then spent that evening singing up a storm and partying in that fancy hotel lobby, it was really an analogy for his whole government. A half trillion dollar party with other people's money and Canadians got the hangover. A million and a half visits in one month to the food bank. The fastest rising interest rates in 30 years. Fastest inflation in four decades. When will the government realize that Canadians are out of money and the party's over? Here. The Honourable Minister for Families. Mr. Speaker, the Leader of the Opposition seems to have amnesia because over the past two and a half years it has been this government that has supported Canadians in their darkest hour. Mr. Speaker, we supported nine million Canadians with the Canada Emergency Response Benefit. Mr. Speaker, we supported millions of Canadians with the Canada Emergency Wage Supports. And Mr. Speaker, we have supported thousands of businesses and organizations with the SEBA. Mr. Speaker, I only can imagine that the Leader of the Opposition is suggesting that we would have not done that and we would have seen a tank in our economy. Mr. Speaker, we did not do that. We will not take any lessons from them, and we will continue to support the Honourable Leader of the Opposition. No, they had a big party with other people's money. The only problem is most people weren't invited to the party. Uh, the We Charity was invited. They got a half billion dollars. The Arrive scam contractors were invited. They got millions of dollars of contracts, in, in many cases, to do no work. And many of the dollars are still under, unaccounted for. Of course, uh, other Liberal insiders got the money. Of course, even prisoners got Serb checks. That's how they racked up a half trillion dollars in inflationary deficits that have bid up the cost of the goods we buy and the interest we pay. Again, will they realize that the money's out and the party's over? Mr. Speaker, let's be clear. What the Conservatives are saying is that 
that they would not have had CERB that kept millions of Canadians at home. They wouldn't have voted in favour of the wage subsidy that supported millions, uh, thousands, even in the oil sector. And they wouldn't have had rent support with tens of thousands of companies being helped. What they're in favour of is cryptocurrency. That's not a plan. And we have one they don't. The opposition. As part of their money printing scheme, this government flooded the financial and mortgage markets with $400 billion of cash that bid up house prices faster than at any time in history. Home prices doubled under this Prime Minister, creating the second biggest housing bubble on planet Earth. The government said rates would never rise, and families believed them. But quoting City News, now that they have right risen, Rob and his wife have an adjustable rate mortgage and say their payments have gone up $2,000 a month. They have three kids. They can't pay it. What the hell do they do now? Yeah. I, I just want to remind the honourable members that parliamentary language, I mean, that's kind of pushing it. Uh, uh, just to remember, the Honourable Minister for Housing. Mr. Speaker, uh, we on this side of the House understand the importance of keeping access to the Canadian dream of home ownership alive. But the leader of the official opposition's voting record really shows that he doesn't actually care about making housing more affordable for working people across the country. And he has all he has to offer is empty rhetoric and buzzwords. Now he wants to gatekeep rent supports for people who need it the most. He wants to gatekeep uh, dental supports for kids. This is not a plan, and Canadians expect better. The Honourable Member for La Prairie. Mr. Speaker, if the government and the NDP really wanted to help Quebec families with dental care, they could have reached an agreement with Quebec. 100 per cent of the costs for Quebec children would be covered and according to the amount they actually paid. But instead, they created a dental check from scratch to which half of Quebec families don't have access and for which there's no control over expenses. Imagine someone who has a dentist fee of 20 cents can incur up to $650 in expenses for the state. It's an aberration. Why, the, why didn't they just come to agreement with Quebec? It's so simple. The Honourable Minister of Canadian Heritage, Mr. Speaker, the Government of Canada will give support to families who need it the most. And dental care is a part of it. We're thinking about a children who cannot afford to go to the dentist. They have a lack of confidence at school. They can't approach their friends. And sometimes they need to go to the dentist. They'll be isolated otherwise. So there are real consequences if they don't have enough money to go to the dentist. So, Mr. Speaker, the Bloc doesn't care about that. The Honourable Member for La Prairie. Well, they didn't even try to discuss this with, with Quebec, because is dental insurance not what they bought? It's majority insurance that they're paying for. This check serves no other purpose than to keep their majority. And with a nice big maple leaf on this check, they invented a botched benefit which discriminates against Quebecers, and it they spending without control. Why should Quebecers pay more than their fair share that, so that other provinces can go to the dentist and they won't be paid as much? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'd like to thank my colleague for his question. The Canadian Dental Benefit will be offered to all Canadian families and Quebecers who are eligible, including those who are covered by public insurance programs. Our program is there to directly help families who need the assistance. And there is no withdrawal mechanism because it's not a negotiation with the government of Quebec. Thank you. The de Rosemont, la petite patrie. The honourable member for Rosemont. Mr. Speaker, there are people who are hungry in our country right now. There are people who are hungry. In a country as rich as ours, it's a shame. Food Banks Canada posted a report today saying that food bank use has never been so high. 1.5 million visits in one month. People are going without, and the Liberals to stand up to the CEOs of the big grocery chains to make them pay what they owe us. When will the Liberals truly tackle the corporate greed that keep families from feeding their children? The Honourable Minister. I'd like to thank my colleague for his question. Clearly, 
we take this issue very seriously, and that's exactly why as soon as we were elected in 2015, we were there for families and for children. 1.5 million Canadians were lifted out of poverty as of 2015, including thousands of children, and we're going to continue to be there for Canadians. And today, everyone in this House has the opportunity to support Canadian children, and I hope that the Conservative members will also do so. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Cowichan, Malahat Langford. Mr. Speaker, families are making difficult choices about what food they can afford, and costs are only getting higher. Today, a report from the Food Bank of Canada proved people just can't keep up. At record rates, families are turning to food banks to get the help they need. The Liberals have a responsibility to support Canadians. Instead, they've sided with rich grocery seats CEOs who are hiding behind inflation to line their pockets. When will the Liberals hold big grocers accountable for the price gouging Canadian families are experiencing? The Honourable Minister for Innovation. I think that everyone in this house is concerned about inflation and about the price that Canadians are facing when they go grocery shopping across the country, Mr. Speaker. That's exactly why, Mr. Speaker, I called upon uh, the leaders of these uh, supermarkets and chains across the nation to do their part to help Canadians. I did call myself a number of them to say we want to see action. But in addition to that, Mr. Speaker, I demanded from the Competition Bureau to start an inquiry and a study to make sure that we're looking to make sure there's no unlawful practice. We will do everything we can to support Canadian families at this time. The Honourable Member for Calgary Forest Lawn. The Liberal made inflationary fire is hitting Canadians' pocketbooks, and Liberals will throw more fuel on that fire by triple, triple, tripling the carbon tax. Food Banks Canada says 40 year high inflation in groceries is forcing 20% of Canadians to food banks, one third of whom are children. Liberals caused the inflation with their out of control spending, and now they're raising taxes when Canadians cannot afford it. When will the Liberals stop their inflationary spending and stop raising taxes? The Honourable Minister for Tourism. Mr. Speaker, let's be clear about what the Conservatives are saying. They are saying that they wouldn't have put in place the CERB, which helped keep millions of Canadians in their homes. They wouldn't have put in place the wage subsidy, which kept 60,000 people in the oil and gas sector in Alberta alone employed. They wouldn't have done the rent subsidy, which kept thousands of businesses open. Mr. Speaker, they want Canadians to be left on their own. We have their backs. The Honourable Member for Calgary, Forest Lawn. The Prime Minister isn't serious about helping Canadians. He spent $24,000 on his hotel stay in London. That's the average annual rental cost in Canada, and he blew it in four days. Families and students are going to food banks and homeless shelters because this Prime Minister's inflationary policies uh, are, are driving up the costs while he sings in luxury hotels abroad, finally putting his drama degree to use. He caused the inflation and interest rate hikes with out-of-control spending. How does he justify this to struggling Canadians? Yeah, yeah. Here. The Honourable Minister for Housing. The leader of the official opposition talks about taking on gatekeepers, but you know what we found? He's the biggest gatekeeper <laughs> keeping Canadians away from rental supports now. He's the biggest gatekeeper who voted against the Canada Housing Benefit. He's the biggest gatekeeper that has voted against the Housing Accelerator Fund. He is full of buzzwords and nonsense. He doesn't help Canadian families who, on this side of the House, we're here to help Canadian families. He can change his ways today and vote to deliver much-needed rental supports today. I just want to remind the honourable members to pay attention to their whip. The Very good. The honourable member for South Surrey, White Rock. The people of Vancouver Island can't afford this costly coalition. Residents of Port Alberni pay nearly $2 per litre for gas. In Comox, groceries are up 11% since last year. With interest rates on the rise, many islanders are in danger of losing their homes. Their NDP MPs don't care. They're pushing the Liberals to drive up the cost of living with more greedy taxes and unlimited spending. Will the coalition show some compassion, stop their inflationary spending and scrap their tax hikes? Yeah. Yeah. The Honourable Minister for the Environment. 
Mr. Speaker, more than 600 lives were lost in British Columbia due to the heat waves and forest fires, something we've never seen in the history of this country. The most costliest natural catastrophe in the history of our country. Who do the, the official opposition think is paying for the tens of billions of dollars that climate change is costing to British Columbians and to Canadians all across the country, Mr. Speaker? They have no answer whatsoever on the climate crisis. The Honourable Member for South Surrey White Rock. Well, Mr. Speaker, the Minister should tell that to the Liberal MP from Malpec who says he's considering leaving Canada because the cost of living is too high. The interest rate hike is another punch in the gut for people in the Lower Mainland. The impact on renters and homeowners is cruel to families trying to make a living and, make, and meet their costs. This costly coalition is to blame for this mess. Their unrestrained inflationary spending drove up costs and interest rates. NDP Liberals need to stop hurting BC with irresponsible spending and high taxes. Will they ask the triple, triple, triple tax? Yeah. The Honourable Minister for Tourism. No, nope, the Honourable Minister for Environment. Just last week, the Insurance Bureau of Canada unveiled that Storm Fiona caused more, caused more than $600 million of insured loss. These are not total damages, making it the most expensive storm in Atlantic Canada. On this side of the House, we are fighting climate change and supporting Canadian. Just two weeks ago, we sent $186 to families in Ontario, $208 to families in Manitoba, $275 to families in Saskatchewan, and $269 to families in Alberta. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Charlebourg, au saint charles Mr. Speaker, we all remember the logo slogan that said, we're working for the middle class and those who want to join it. Even the President of the Treasury Board was once the Minister of the Middle Class Prosperity, a position that no longer exists, by the way. But what's the bottom line? M Martin Munger, Executive Director of the Quebec Food Bank, tells us that the feed banks are currently facing a 33 increase in demand. Unprecedented. Can the Prime Minister promise not to raise taxes so that those who are part of the middle class can at least stay there? The Honourable Minister. We understand that the cost of living is very high for Canadians right now. And this is exactly why today there is an opportunity for all members of this House to support aid for Canadians and Canadian families with support for dental care and rental income. It's important for everyone to do this because cost of living is high right now. And I hope we can count on the Conservative members to vote with us to support families and Canadians across this country. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Charlebourg, au saint charles Mr. Speaker, when the Prime Minister decided to end the position of the Minister of Middle Class Prosperity, it shows that he didn't understand the economy. We recall that once he said he didn't think much of monetary policy and that budgets balanced themselves. But the Royal Bank confirms that middle class Canadians could see their purchasing power fall by $3,000 rather by the first half of 2023. And in Quebec, half a million food bank users are children. Can the Prime Minister be serious for once in his life and promise not to raise taxes? The Honourable Minister. Let's go back over our record. In 2015, when we introduced the CCB, what did the Conservatives do? They voted against it. Mr. Speaker, when we introduced support for daycare and early childhood learning, what did they do? They voted against it. And since 2015, we have lifted thousands of children out of poverty today. They do have an opportunity, if they really want to support families, to help them with dental care. Mr. Speaker, can we count on the Conservatives? Will they be there for Canadian families for the first time? I don't know. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Joliet. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The year ahead is going to be a difficult one. A new increase in the policy rate yesterday will increase household debt. The cost of living remains astronomical and a recession is looming. The government will have to make some tough choices in the economic date that will come in coming weeks. Spending like a crazy uh, person would add fuel to the fire and banding the core emissions, core emissions of the government is a false solution. The government will have to 
choose between austerity and austerity spending is austerity abandoning the most vulnerable who will they choose mr speaker i'd like to thank my colleague for his question he knows full well that the bank of canada is an independent institution and this bank help us get through tough times in our society our responsibility is to be fiscally responsible. We got through the pandemic. We have a concrete plan to reduce the cost of living. We're putting support in for the most vulnerable Canadians, and I hope that the Bloc, the NDP, and the Conservatives will all vote for Canadians and for C31. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Joliet. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. That's not clear. Amongst the most vulnerable people the government can't abandon are seniors. Food Gank Banks Canada has shown that records were broken for this year. 33% more Quebecers are now using food banks uh, compared to 2019. And the first people that are in line at the food banks are seniors who can no longer cope. Seniors can't take it anymore. Will this government stop discriminating against them based on age and increase OAS for everyone 65 and over? The Honourable Minister of Seniors challenges the seniors are facing with paying their bills and the grocery costs and Mr. Speaker that's precisely why we've been there from them from the very beginning. Uh, Mr. Speaker that's exactly why we're doubling the GST tax credit putting more money in their pockets. That's precisely why we're um, nearly helping two million low-income renters uh, that will receive financial receipt. Mr. Speaker that's precisely why we increase the old age security for seniors. Mr. Speaker we're going to continue to be there for seniors and Canadians. Thank you. Bravo. The Honourable Member for Shefford. They're forgetting half of that because abandoning seniors isn't being rigorous, it's austerity. We're talking about people who have worked hard for decades and to end up for the first time of their lives having to turn to a food bank. It's not true that the rising cost of living treats people 75 and years of age and under differently. There aren't two classes of seniors. There are just two classes of seniors in federal support. When will the government realize that the cost of living does not discriminate by age? The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, here's a theme that's very important that is really worth being debated. Yes, the bloc had one day in the opposition to debate a very important theme, and I'm very surprised and also disappointed that the bloc chose another theme rather than seniors or the fight against poverty. Now they have a chance to make up for it. Will they support our government on dental and rental care? Thank you. St. Paul. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, throughout this RCMP political interference scandal, the minister has been using very specific legal words concerning ministerial directives to the RCMP. But whether or not he directed the RCMP commissioner, it does not preclude political interference or inappropriate pressure. It doesn't rule it out, Mr. Speaker. Did he or his staff have any conversations with the commissioner concerning the release of weapons information or the pending Liberal gun control legislation after the massacre and before the April 28th press conference? Conference. Yes or no, Mr. Speaker? Great question. The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, and the members, the member opposite's assertions are completely incorrect. The independence of police operations is a key principle in our democracy. It's a, it's a government, one that our government deeply respects, one that I have always respected, and one which I have always vigorously defended. I, I'm just going to interrupt for a moment. It's pretty bad when I see people on one side who are trying to listen and holding on to their earpiece because they can't hear. So I just want everyone to be able to hear the answer. The Honourable Minister from the top, please, so everyone can understand and hear Thank what you're saying. Thank you very saying. much, Mr. Speaker. And, and, as I have said, the member's assertion um, in this matter is completely incorrect. And it's not surprising that the members opposite don't actually want to hear the facts. But here they are, Mr. Speaker. At no time did I or any member of our government attempt to interfere in police operations. And to be very explicit and clear, with words I hope the member might understand, I did not direct, I did not ask, and I did not suggest to the, to the, to the, to the, to the RCMP Commissioner to release information. And as she's testified under oath, Mr. Speaker, before the Mass Casualty Commission, and she said, I did not receive direction and I was not influenced by government. Honourable Member for Kildonan St. Paul. Mr. Speaker, we have on the audio recording the Commissioner saying that Minister's office requested that she do this. That's irrefutable, Mr. 
Mr. Speaker. So I'm going to ask him again. Did his office or himself have any conversations with the commissioner concerning the liberal gun control policy after that tragic massacre that killed 22 Canadians? Did his office politicize their deaths, Mr. Speaker? Yes or no? The Honourable Minister. No, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Sturgeon River Parkland. Mr. Speaker, former Liberal Insider and RCMP Director of Issues Management Dan Bryan recorded the April 28th meeting with Commissioner Lucky. When investigators came for the recording, he claimed that his phone had been stolen and that he had deleted the recording. We now find out that the phone was not stolen and that the recording had not been deleted from his personal phone. Honest mistake, I guess. Did the minister's office communicate with Dan Bryan about this recording, and when and how did the minister become aware of its existence? The Honourable Minister. Neither I nor my office communicated with Mr. O'Brien about any aspect of, of this matter. Um, I have absolutely no knowledge about that except what I've read in the papers. The Honourable Member for Churchill, Kiwetnuk, Askey. The Honourable Member for Churchill, Kuwetnugaski. Mr. Speaker, a 15-year-old in Red Sucker Lake First Nation took his life in his own schoolyard following another suicide in 17 attempts. Red Sucker Lake Chief Knott is clear. This is a crisis. Young people need hope. It's time to fix their half-finished arena and deliver the new school they've been promised, build the regional treatment centre they need, ensure people in poverty can afford basic necessities in the face of sky-high prices. It's time to end the third world living conditions. There can be no true reconciliation without action for communities like Red Sucker Lake. When will the Liberals step up. The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, on this side of the House, we completely agree with the member opposite that it is unacceptable to have such levels of disparity across this country for First Nations people. It's why we committed to closing the socioeconomic gaps by 2030. It's why we've redoubled our efforts in investing in infrastructure and mental health and wellness and in supports for communities like Red Sucker Lake across this country. We'll continue, Mr. Speaker, to do more with First Nations partners because every child deserves a fair chance to succeed. The Honourable member for Port Moody Coquitlam. Mr. Speaker, in June, the minister said it would take three years for people living with a disability to get the Canada Disability Benefit. Last week, she told media it would take 12 months. And yesterday, her public servant said they can't set a timeline. This lack of commitment from the Liberals is hurting people who are suffering and cannot wait any longer. When will the Liberals deliver meaningful help to lift one million Canadians living with a disability out of poverty? The Honourable Minister for Families. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I would really like to thank my honourable colleague for that important question. I'm so proud that this House unanimously supported uh, the bill that will bring forward the Canada Disability Benefit. There is so much work to do, but I think what is important is noting that every member of this House believes sincerely that we need to ensure that we are supporting Canadians living with disabilities. We're going to continue doing that work, and we're going to ensure that we are... Uh, um, enabling Canadians with disabilities a life of dignity. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Vaudreuil Soulange. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I quote Carbon pricing is a remarkably elegant market solution to reducing emissions. Pricing would enable the reduction of a wide array of regulations and government interferences in the market. Pricing would give consumers and companies clear signals about the cost of negative externality and allow them to figure out for themselves the best way to respond. Can the Minister of Environment and Climate Change tell us if he agrees with this, but also who said this? Honourable <laughs> Minister of the Environment. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Who said this? None other than the Conservative Party of Canada's Director of Communications, Whoa. Bed Woodfinden. He also said, and I quote, instead of scoring cheap political points, Conservatives need to get serious and offer their own alternative. Where's this alternative, Mr. Speaker? Whoa. So why doesn't the leader of the opposition listen to his own Director of Communications and get serious and step up for climate action and a resilient, low-carbon economy. But I didn't hear it. Come and see me. 
The Honourable Member for Alderman Norfolk. Mm. Mr. Speaker, while Canadians were distracted during the, the pandemic, this government engaged in hundreds of millions of dollars of wasteful spending, including $54 million in a dysfunctional Arrive Can app that discriminated against seniors and sent thousands of vaccinated Canadians into quarantine. Wasteful spending is the cause of this current inflationary crisis. Canadians cannot afford this costly coalition anymore. Will the Liberals stop their inflationary spending? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of Health. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I'm sure. happy to stand in this House and extol the important virtues of, of vaccination over the last couple of years. Indeed, Mr. Speaker, only uh, only very, very few Canadians have decided not to get vaccinated, and that means uh, that we've, we've done quite well in terms of the fatality rate in Canada. And it's so important that Canadians consider now, this fall, getting a bivalent uh, vaccine for, for themselves and, the, and their families. So I'd encourage every Canadian to speak to their health care provider or their doctor and consider flu shots and bivalent vaccines this fall. Thank hey, you, I'm Mr. Doing Speaker. I'm doing the Honourable Member for Haldeman Norfolk. Mr. Speaker, again, that was a non-answer. I was speaking about wasteful spending, Mr. Speaker, during COVID. This government also wasted $54 million on a failed Arrive Can app. That one developer replicated this app, Mr. Speaker, in one weekend and said it shouldn't have cost more than $250,000. In addition, several contractors said that they never worked on the app and they never received the millions of dollars that this government said that they paid to those uh, developers. Where did the money go? Who got rich? The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, we are aware of the costs related to ArriveCan. We are investigating these costs. But Mr. Speaker, ArriveCan was important for digitizing the border, for making sure that we kept Canadians safe, for making sure that we could reopen the borders. The other side was hooing and hollering at us to make sure that we opened the borders. We had a tool in place to make sure that we did that. We invested $72 billion in Canadians' health to get us through the pandemic. They wanted us to invest less. We invested the right amount. The economy is healthy. And now they're upset because we did the right thing. The Honourable Member for Thornhill. Did the Department of Heritage ask well-known, well-documented, self-declared anti-Semite Laith Maruf to apply for funding? Yes or no? <laughs> the Honourable Minister for Housing. Mr. Speaker, as I've stated before and I'll say it again, anti-Semitism, hate and racism have no place in our society. Uh, we, the funding to this organization has been cut and we've demanded repayment of the, of the funding. We are implementing new measures to improve the Department of Canadian Heritage's vetting processes to ensure that this never happens again. On this side of the House, we will ensure that we always, always stand against anti-Semitism and hate in all its forms. Honourable Member for Thornhill. Here's the problem. Known racist Laith Maroof got $133,000 of Canadian tax money from the department Shameful. that claims he, he was begged to apply for it. The Minister of Diversity found out about his department funding, this vile anti-Semite, more than a month before he acknowledged it publicly. Now, wow. the Minister of Heritage now claims that he didn't know about his department funding this racist until he read about it in a newspaper a month later, which of course no one believes. Who's lying? Laith Maroof? The Minister Minister of Diversity, the Minister of Heritage, or all three? Let me be absolutely clear. This organization was not approached by the Department of Canadian Heritage and was not specifically asked to run a program. We in this side of the House have repeatedly condemned anti-Semitic and vile and reprehensible comments against various groups made by this individual. We've cut the funding to this organization. We've demanded the money back, and we're improving the vetting processes to make sure this never happens again. The Honourable Member from Montarville. Mr. Speaker, the U.S. Secretary of State will be meeting the, with the Prime Minister later today. I know that they will be discussing some very important, critical issues, including the situation in Haiti, Ukraine, and Iran. They will also be discussing the issue of refugees in North America. Right now, thousands of asylum seekers are crossing the border irregularly, without protection, at their own risk. Mr. Speaker, people who need help are not to be received in this way. Will the Prime Minister discuss with the Secretary of State the suspension of the safe third country agreement? 
the Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Mr Speaker, first of all, I would like to, uh, on behalf of all of us, wish a warm welcome to US Secretary of State Blinken, who is meeting the, uh, his counterpart here in Canada. As we have said a number of times already, modernizing the agreement between our two countries is something that is happening right now, something that we are committed to do. And, Mr Speaker, what we are currently doing is enacting this approach, and I am proud to have this visit here in Canada. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Lac Saint Jean. Okay, Mr. Speaker, at the rate things are going, there are likely to be over 30,000 irregular entries at Roxham Road in 2022. Desperate people exploited by criminal smugglers who often offer them false hope are intercepted by the police before they can make an asylum claim. From a strictly humanitarian point of view, this situation cannot continue. However, that is precisely what the government wants to do. Make it last, Mr. Speaker. Will the Prime Minister take advantage of the visit of the US Secretary of State to discuss the suspension once and for all of the Safe Third Country Agreement? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Mr. Speaker, listen. Our asylum system needs to be robust and humane. There is no magical panacea to all this. Asking that Roxham Road be closed or the Safe Third Country Agreement be suspended is not the solution. What we are doing is modernising this agreement, Mr Speaker. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Louis Saint Laurent. Mr Speaker, in the Châtel, there are many food banks. There are shared fridges, three places where people can get food assistance. And in those areas, like elsewhere in Canada, there has been a significant increase in needs over the past few weeks and months. We learned today that 1.5 million Canadians just last month called upon food assistance. Mr. Speaker, it is not a luxury to eat, especially here in Canada. We need to have the means to do so. Can the government at least give good news to Canadians, ensuring that there is no increase in taxes in the next months and years? The Honourable Minister for Families. Mr Speaker, once again, it is difficult to, understand, to believe that the Conservatives are truly here for Canadians. Every time we implement something to help Canadians, those who need help, they vote against. So today they have a golden opportunity to support dental and rental assistance. Will they agree with us and support these measures? We hope that we will be able to count on them today. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Louis Saint Laurent. Canadians hope that they can count on this government to not increase taxes. That is what we're asking of them, Mr. Speaker, because people now have to go to food banks in order to feed themselves. In Canada, this is completely logical. The price of vegetables have, has gone up by 12%, fruit 13%, bakery products 15%, cereal products 18%, Pasta, 36 per cent. Expensive spaghetti means a country that's not in good shape. Can the government commit on behalf of all Canadians to not increasing taxes? It's a simple question. Please say yes. The Honourable Parliamentary Minister for Innovation. Mr. Speaker, I would like to thank my colleague for his question. This is an issue that affects all Canadians and I understand the situation, Mr. Speaker. That is a reason for which, and my colleague knows it full well, he knows it full well. I have spoken to the CEOs, to many large corporations and businesses in Canada, to ask them to do what they can and do their fair share, because in a situation like this, we must all do what we can to reduce prices for consumers. I've asked for the competition office to make sure that there is no disloyal practices here in this country. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Hastings, Lennox and Addington. Mr. Speaker, understanding and doing something about it are two entirely different things. Behind this record inflation and rise in interest rates are real people facing a real and harsh reality. They are exhausted, worried and broke. And this Liberal government is intent on piling on even more financial burdens. Mr. Speaker, I asked this question last week, and I'll ask it again. Will this government listen to Canadians and cancel their plan to triple, triple, triple? 
taxes on gas, groceries, and home heating. Oh, the Honorable Minister of the Environment. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. We waited 416 days for the member of Regina Capel's climate pamphlet when he was leader. The member for Carleton has now been leader of the Conservative Party for 47 days, and guess what? They still don't have a climate plan. Maybe his new director of communication can help his climate-denying boss to get with the program, Mr. Speaker. <laughs> the Honourable Member for dorval la salle Mr. Speaker, the cost of living has increased over recent months in Canada. Canadians are having to tighten their belts in order to make ends meet. Can the Minister for Tourism and Associate Minister for Finance tell the House what the government is doing to help Canadians with the rising cost of living? The Honourable Minister. I'd like to thank my colleague for the for her question and her excellent work. Inflation in Canada may be showing signs of slowing down, but we understand that the cost of living remains high for Canadians. It is an inflation that is caused by the war in Ukraine, problems with supply chains, and the zero COVID policy in China. That is the reason for which we have acted to introduce uh, and table rather bills C30 and C31. While C30 was adopted, we are now ready to adopt C31. We hope that the Conservatives will support Canadians and vote for C31. Honourable Member for Miramichi Grand Lake. Mr. Speaker, the bill has come and due for the Prime Minister's inflationary spendings, and Canadians got clobbered by another massive rate hike. This is the most expensive government in Canadian history. The Prime Minister has added more to the national debt than every Prime Minister combined. Even his own parliamentary budget officer confirmed that 40 per cent of this deficit is not even related to COVID. Wow. Will the Prime Minister end his inflationary spending today? Hey. Here, here. The Honourable Minister of Tourism. Facing a rising cost of living, but let's state the facts. Mr. Speaker, every time that we have let lowered taxes for Canadians, the Conservatives have voted against. They vote. How did they vote against the federal minimum wage? Against. How did they vote against cutting taxes for working Canadians? Against. How did they vote against affordable child care for Canadians? Against. How did they vote when we lowered taxes on small businesses? Against. And are they going to vote for or against today? We'll see, Mr. Speaker. <laughs> the Honourable Member for Miramichi Grand Lake. Mr. Speaker. The Liberals didn't have the backs of Canadians, they went behind their backs. 54 million on a ride scam, 237 million for a former Liberal MP for unused ventilators, 150 million for SNC Lavalin for unused field hospitals, 12 million for Loblaws for new fridges and freezers despite record profits. Yep. Will the Liberals finally end the friends and family programs and give Canadians a break yep. by ending this wasteful yeah, spending? Yeah. Mr. Speaker, for the past two and a half years, the world has been going through an unprecedented global pandemic. What did this government do throughout that period of time? Supported Canadians. We supported Canadians who lost their jobs, nine million, in fact, with the Canada Emergency Response Benefit. We supported businesses who had to close their doors because of public health measures so through the CBA. Mr. Speaker, you know what else we spent on and supported Canadians with? Vaccines that made sure that we saved lives in Canada, Mr. Speaker. We are not going to apologize. For the Honourable Member for South Shore St. Margaret's. The fact that they seem to miss is they spent $600 million supporting high school kids during COVID living at home. While Jill, in my riding, Jill in my riding, who heats with oil, had his tank filled up yesterday for $1,600. That's, that's more than the $900 last year. Okay, I'm having a hard time hearing the question. Order. If I can hear the question from the top, please, so we can all hear it, and then hopefully we'll be able to hear the answer as well. The Honourable Member. They'd like to hear it again. They spent $600 million supporting high school kids with CERB, while Jill, from my riding, heats with oil and had to fill up yesterday, and it cost $1,600 to fill the tank. It was $900 last year. This just incredible 
68 percent increase in his heating as a result of this government's policies, while they still want to impose another $360 in new carbon taxes on his oil tanks. Many people in my community have to choose between heat and eating. When will these Liberals stop their triple, triple— Minister for Families. Speaker, the lack of compassion being demonstrated on the other side for Canadians who lost their jobs, for Canadians who lost their income. Okay, we were... Order. Order! Thank you. So, we took the time and listened to the question. Now let's do the same thing to the answer that's given. The Honourable Minister for Families, from the top, please. Mr. Speaker, the lack of compassion being heard from the other side about pandemic supports that supported families, that made sure that parents could put food on the table, that parents could pay their rent or their mortgage, that families could ensure that they knew that they would be able to get through to the end of the month because of the Canada Emergency Response Benefit is unbelievable from the Conservatives. Mr. Speaker, if they truly had compassion, if they truly cared about supporting Canadian families, they would vote with us today on C31 and provide... The Honourable Member for Mississauga Streetsville. Mr. Speaker, the brutal murder of Masa Amini 40 days ago yesterday has sparked a feminist movement in Iran and across the globe. The Women Life Freedom Movement began with Iranian girls and women marching in the streets in defiance of the IRGC in the defense of freedom and democracy. Women across Canada and all corners of the world recognize these women and stand with them. In light of the courage and the tenacity of Iranian women, can the Minister of Women and Gender Equality and Youth share what our government is doing to fight for women's rights around the world? The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, I thank the Honourable Member for her extraordinary leadership. At the G7, I called on our allies to sign a joint statement to condemn the Iranian regime. I said then, and I said... We were doing well, and then all of a sudden it went, I don't know where the heck it went, but uh, I'm going to ask the honourable members to please calm down. Well, one in particular who tends to have a very high voice that he's screaming across. And uh, we'll let the uh, minister start from the top, please. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I want to thank the member for her extraordinary leadership. At the G7, I called on our allies to sign a joint statement to condemn the Iranian regime. I said at that point, and I'm saying now, that this is not about headscarves. This, Mr. Speaker, is about human rights. I stand by that. Our government stands by that. I have to tell you, it takes immense courage to speak your truth. And I was so moved last night when women just did that. They shared their stories at a vigil for Masa Amini. I want women here and around the world to know, Mr. Speaker, we stand with them. The Honourable Member for Windsor West. Mr. Speaker, on top of sky-high prices for food and rent, Canadians struggle to pay massively high cell phone bills each month. The announcement this week on the Roger Shaw merger proved there is a place to regulate gouging. Despite the Minister's new position, the Competition Bureau still wants the merger stopped. Instead of blocking the merger and the entirety, the Minister told the companies to go back to the drawing board in their CEO tables. This government needs to stand up to the corporate greed from big telecom companies who also get public money. When will this government act to stop the Roger Shaw merger so Canadians can put get some relief on their monthly bills? When will he finally side with consumers? The Honourable Minister for Innovation. Mr. Speaker, that, it, that answer is very simple. Every single day, Mr. Speaker. That's exactly what I did, Mr. Speaker. I would, you know, that's a member for whom I have enormous respect, but I would bring him back to this statement, Mr. Speaker. We actually blocked the merger of Sean Roger. I denied the license. Maybe it's a part of the statement he missed. But in addition to that, Mr. Speaker, we said we support the work of the Competition Bureau. 
And should they allow the merger to happen, we impose additional conditions. We said that they would have to keep the license for at least 10 years, and the lower price you see in Quebec, which are about 20 percent lower, would have to be applied in Ontario and Western Canada. We will stand on the side of Canadians every single day, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Kitchener Centre. Mr. Speaker, Atalti is a permanent resident in my in my community who applied for a travel document last February to join his wife in Sweden for the birth of their daughter. Eight months later, Atalti's request still has not been processed, even though it was marked urgent. We are working with dozens of refugees and permanent residents who are waiting months or even a year for travel documents they need to travel and return to our country. Can the immigration a minister commit to a timeline for a telty to meet his daughter. The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of Immigration. Mr. Speaker, I, I want to first start by commending the member of Kitchener Centre for his advocacy. We are taking measures to reduce wait times and will be doing more to tackle the backlog in the short term while making our system more sustainable in the long term. We are doing that by hiring up to 1,250 new employees to increase our processing capacity by the end of fall. We are aiming to process 80 percent of all new applications within service standard. And, Mr. Speaker, modernizing our immigration system is about putting the people at the heart of everything we do, and that's exactly what we're doing. Uh, before we go to the point of orders, there's a few of them uh, tonight and uh, this afternoon. Je voudrais signaler aux députés la. I would like to tell members that we have in the gallery His Excellency Musafaki Mohamed, the president of the Union African African Union Commission. Now we have, a, a, I, think, I believe we have three points of order that I can see. We'll start with the Honourable Opposition House Leaders rising.